It is my honor to introduce today's guest, Kim Abelis. Kim is a LA-based artist and professor emeritus. In fact, one of my highlights of my art studies was to have her as a professor. What interests me is her devotion to community-based projects. She has created projects with the California Science Center, air pollution control agencies, health and mental clinics, and natural history museums in various states. Abelis received the 2013 Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, and she is the recipient of fellowships from many organizations, which include the J. Paul Getty Trust Fund and California Community Foundation. In 1987, she innovated a method to create images from the smog in the air, and the Smog Collectors series brought her work to national and international attention. Her work is in 35 public collections, including MOCA, LACMA, Berkeley Art Museum, and the California African American Museum. Hi, Kim. Always so nice to see you. I last saw you when we were when you gave your talk at Transcendence at the at the exhibition, and soon after that, right? Just a few days oh. after that, this craziness happened. You're nearly minutes later. Right? <laughs> exactly. Who would have? I mean, there was inklings of it, but who knows? Man. Who knew it would hit us so so strongly like that? Um, and since then, you know, we've been in self-imposed isolation and things like that and trying to recover through all this. I'm wondering, um, how are things with you, you know, during, during this time of the pandemic? Yeah, I've, I've been all right. I think mm -hmm. I know you were saying, you know, there's this one side of you that is also glad to have more studio time. And I've heard a lot of artists say that. And uh, I am very grateful to have creative things that I can be doing because I just need a way to funnel my impressions. You're right. We as artists are lucky that many of us create art in the privacy of our studios. And you're continuing an important project of yours, The Small Collectors. The show now is rescheduled for next year, like early next year. But one thing I was doing as sort of the last of the smog collectors, you know, for 2020, because it was representing my work from 1987 to 2020, mm. is a very large five foot by 15 foot portrait, really, um, of a woman holding her skirt out to collect the smog. And then when the quarantine happened, I thought, oh, I'm going to bring this into the studio. And I laid it out. And of course, you see the, you know, there's particulate that comes in the windows as well as outdoors. So I'm very close to the Bobcat fire, one of the mm. California fires that are raging right now. Mm. And we're like in the foothills below it. And, mm. uh, I actually put smog collectors on my roof the other day because oh I just thought, oh my God, you know, this is all smoke and ash and, right. and our air quality index is so bad right oh now because God. of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's obviously a relationship with oil fields and oil products and, and the environment. So the image I picked, I can show you this and I could send you an image, but yeah. this is on the rooftop. They're deck chairs from the Titanic. Ah, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I love how you layer, you always layer. <laughs> this, yeah, I, humor in it. <laughs> I really was feeling, I just couldn't not do this, you know. Um, so that'll be a series while this is going on. Oh I mean, God, um, yeah. I always, somebody on Facebook said, oh, Kim, you're always trying to make lemonade out of lemons, you know. I think there's some truth to that. Do you see these wildfires as an indication of climate change? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, on the newscastings about the, the fires, they are 
talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. And normally they did not talk about that at all up until honestly this last month. The issue is that all these droughts that we've had, which are caused by you know the climate crisis and so on, all these things have amped up. And I think finally people are waking to this. And I guess that's what the Titanic image was, sort of like, you know, all our F environmental efforts uh, have been very, very important, but we still have a great deal to do to really change it. I always thought that if we, if we did things individually, it, it would work. You know, we could make for change. You know, look at your exhibit with the heroes. Those are individual people that did so much to help large communities oh my God. so that's definitely operative but we also really do need leadership and corporations to play their part i'm happy to do my recycling and you know try to do better with using mass transit and stuff we we also do need a larger organizational thrust, you know, to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make the kinds of urgent changes that we need. It's been a wake up call. I think right. these fires, especially in our region. Do you as artists, have you witnessed a change that has happened through your art or, you know, can you yeah. put that, articulate that at all? Yeah. You know, it's funny you ask that because I get that, asked that question when I speak environmental conferences or uh, more scientific conferences where I'm mm. asked sometimes or on panels uh, because, you know, people are looking for quantitative ideas about change. But in the science community, for instance, it's, it's never really enough to say my neighbor started raising red worms for composting, you know. I did this citywide project with the Bureau of Automotive Repair, and one of the council people in the, in the uh, state government was very upset that they had paid an artist to do these log collectors. It wasn't a lot of money, I assure you, to begin with, but they had a hearing up in Sacramento about it, and they needed proof that it was worth the money. I know that they got um, three, three and a half million dollars worth of free publicity, advertising, educational things in newspapers, radio spots, television spots, magazines from the project. And so it really proved that this $3,000 investment really garnered a large educational response. So that's a quantitative thing. The other one that I, I would love to be able to prove is, is perhaps more anecdotal, but I don't know if you've ever seen that storm drain dolphin suitcase I made, but I did. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And on that one, one of the talking points when I would use that is we're about the straws. I would always ask the kids, okay, and I see the straws on this artwork. If you throw away one straw, is that a big deal? It's not a big deal, right? And then I'd say, okay, now all of you kids, there'd be like 35 of them in front of me, for instance. If all of you threw away a straw, wow, now what? You know, what's that mean? So to really try for them to understand not only the infrastructure of the storm drain system that cities have mm -hmm. and the importance of not littering on the street because it ends up on the beach, but, you know, also the general thing about consumption, you know, like what are these accumulative effects that we have? And again, and that's back to the individual, right? Like one individual messing up may be no big deal, but I'm telling you, we're all messing up. And so it's really that, you know, additive effect that is why we've really got our hands full now environmentally. The other thing, you know, I think um, because I do a lot of art science uh, projects, okay. the other thing, or, or with other kinds of communities, 
is that I think when we inject art into these communities and these other professions, mm -hmm. it really gives them a new view on what they are doing also. Mm. And in, in terms of science, I often hear them say, you know, Kim, they'll kind of almost whisper this to me. <laughs> we have all the facts, but we do not know how to communicate them because you cannot just hand people a bunch of statistics and expect them to feel anything for that. So I think that's where all of us as artists really play an important role. That's excellent. And in fact, what I really, really love about your work is that you are showing at places like the California Science Center or the health clinics or the mental health department and the, the National Park Service. I really think you reach out wider than that art you know, audience, but I really admire that you show in those kind of venues. And yeah, thanks. Yeah. They're more fun, they're more fun really. I mean, you know, I do have to show at art venues <laughs> okay. to survive as an artist, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think I always need to straddle that and I'm pretty aware of that, like just as a kind of survival instinct. Mm. But the audiences I do like, they will really ask me. They won't just like figure it's good, you know? they they really would like to know deeper like what my intentions are and stuff so as an artist and a creative person it really always challenges me to self-reflect about what is the meaning of doing this i'm not really trying to you know there's a great quote i've given a million times from um harry gamboa don't do art that's just decorating a time bomb and I think of that quote a million mm -hmm. times and I've said it a million times because I think that's where doing um, socially relevant art, mm -hmm. it's always kind of a balance of, okay, what is really the intention here? Who is really the audience? You mm -hmm. know, I really want to reach the heart with the information. Mm -hmm. So kind of weaving between those things is pretty exhilarating, I've got to say, but it also presents some very real challenges. So I learn more from them than they do from me, I believe. I'm really impressed with how much time you invest in community and during your projects. It seems like you really get in there and work directly with community. I think the National Park Service project you did is a very good example. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I learned an awful lot from that one because mm -hmm. I worked six months with the incarcerated women that mm -hmm. uh, are doing our firefighting. And um, that is really where I had a, an awakening in a sense about working with groups. Nobody really had to work with me up there they just on a voluntary basis could come and do what I was doing mm. or work beside me and so on. Mm. And I, re I realized normally groups I worked with in the past have often had a reason they had to work with me. They either got some kind of grade or credit toward <laughs> something they needed, or they, if they were maybe in a halfway house, maybe I was part of the curriculum. So to stay in the halfway house, they had to work on whatever projects came forth. And it really gave me an awakening about like, did all those people really want to work with me? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so up there, it was really great because I realized I needed to make it really a, a very two-way conversation. Mm. Uh, this wasn't about me coming in, you know, making demands of right. the outcome. Yeah. And I really took to heart the information the women gave me about fire abatement and firefighting and also got to understand how the creative process brings people together because one woman up there, she would come every Sunday, but she never was really working with us. And, but she'd always come. And I finally said to her, why do you come up here? I mean, what's going on? You're welcome to work, you know, whatever. But she said, I come up here because most of these women would never interact with each other ever. And I like to see how art has really made them 
share information, teach each other like skill sets that we were sharing. Uh -huh. And she just wanted to see that. And I do think that's like an amazing thing that all the arts can do, not just visual art, uh, as you as you know, you know, but all the arts, all the creative sources really bring us together and we kind of forget about our differences. I see that in your work, that you love research and you love digging up facts and digging up anything you can. It, did that start in your childhood, I'm wondering? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think uh -huh. one, of my, one of my life goals, like as a young kid, yeah. was I thought if I went through the alphabet A to Z and made a list of every topic and then I just wanted to take every topic and think about it and understand it. The A to Z of everything. <laughs> well, I, I will die probably never getting to the end of Oh, that. no. But I, you know, <laughs> I think for me, though, you know what this thing is? All these subjects that are what life is composed of, uh -huh. they are all interrelated. To me, that's the fascination, like those overlaps of information. Uh -huh. Everywhere they interconnect mm -hmm. unexpectedly are when I think, wow, this is such an amazing complex puzzle that has mm -hmm. been created by nature and life and people. Mm -hmm. it, it's really pretty amazing how complex yet mm -hmm. all the simple connections are mm -hmm. so lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to assume or it appears that you use many ready-mades in your projects. I know everybody thinks that, but I fabricate so many of those things. Oh. Like, <laughs> like, no, no, no. It's, but they're meant to look like something that was found. I did this piece on Anne Lee, for instance. She founded the Shaker community in upstate New York. And I wove a hat that was just like the hats they used. Uh -huh. And I made all the elements that were designed, you know, to look like replicas or miniatures of what they made. And it's definitely supposed to look like I found those, you know. <laughs> So, so there are definitely found objects, but I think my relationship to that kind of work, assemblage or ready-mades, mm -hmm. is that um, mm -hmm. I'm more of the camp that I have been given or have found a lot of stuff through my career, and I keep them in boxes, and one day they make sense with a subject. I, I also have to chuckle at the self-portrait that it's called the self-portrait with files. Is is that how you feel sometimes when you're doing all your research? <laughs> I still feel that way, yeah. It was, it was that pile actually, and I did, you probably see the one where I'm, you know, poured over the top of it. Right, I, right. I took that photo also, by the way. So there are a lot of attempts at that that didn't work. Uh -huh. That was done with film. And uh, I did a lot of different self-portraits with those files. I kind of birthed them and I levitated on them. And those are all the files from all my exhibits and the paperwork related oh. to the show. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, my God. So that's what that is. So, you know, now you understand even further, right? Like, those right. are my burdens. But I think when people see that photograph in particular, I because I see it in offices a lot, like, because I've made a lot of postcards of them. And I know that anybody that deals with paperwork, especially probably for other people, yeah. you know, they just that is their comic relief um i am for the city of for the, well actually la county and the park service and also local community groups um i am making i'm going to show you but i'll send you there are six sculptures that are very large they're human size they're oh, wow. seeds of local Southern, Cal Southern California plants, and they're like four feet and six feet and eight feet long, like um, that. And they're seeds that'll be along the trail at, um, it's called Park to Playa. It's a trail that the full trail leads from 
east of Culver City Beach and it connects trails along the way, but the seeds actually, there's a community component in it. And um, so we're in fabrication right now on those. They're supposed to be installed by the end of the year. Oh my God. Kim, you're always making such powerful connections and weaving the story and, and into community. I love it. I really, really love it. So, Thank you. Uh, but I really enjoyed my talk with you and you made me laugh a lot and, and relate to certain things, but, um, you know, just keep going and we Thank need it. We, we really need it. And we need, I love this period of art because I feel it's a, a lot of it is about social activism. And I think that um, it's a really uh, amazing time when artists could learn how to make a change and they should look at, at your work, what you do. But Kim, again, thank you so much. Thank you, okay. thank you. Thank you, Taiji. So okay, much. okay, talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye.